Hello, welcome back. I'm waiting for my car and we're gonna go go around town. See what we can get up to. Is that a hot way? It's just like it. That's a big deal. Communist poster, Revolution Cuba. Oh, I go blind sometimes. For a brighter future, cut down capitalism. Oh, sorry. Get away from my car. Time to do this. Frisco Fields, the privilege dies slow. One way to handle the firepower these recruits are carrying would be a nice fat bumper to their goddamn skull.
gonna make a quick stop. Hey, what's up, buddy? Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Welcome, subject number four. This will show you how to do it. Hey, don't tell me it's done this fucking guy. Hey, what are you guys standing around here? Must be Door to get down. Fuck.
November 1956. Well, I'm just going to have a quick read of this. Norman Thomas, The Candid Conversation with the Elder Statesman, Statesman of America Socialism. American Socialism, champion of radical reform and outspoken opponent, opponent of the war in Vietnam. And here he is saying, I always get more applause than votes. In general, I found today's young much more militant in criticism than in proposing practical alternatives, let alone in carrying them out. Ways, oh, I don't think I don't think our technology and our ways of ways of making a living are are so disastrous to the individual. I've never behaved there. I've never believed there was an Eden from which the individual was driven by General Motors. Jesus Christ! By our own blundering, by our irrationally by our inheritance, genetic and political. We are being swept along paths that are far more likely to lead to war than not to. And I mean a very big war. <laughs> Alright, Playboy starts off here by asking this guy in recent months, you have been particularly active in demonstrations, speeches, and articles as a critic of the administration's policy in Vietnam. Are you advocating, as some of your critics seem to believe, unilateral withdrawal? No, I am not. I do feel we had no business getting into Vietnam, but once there, we do have certain responsibilities. I would not, for example, want to withdraw at the expense of allowing a subsequent massacre of those who have opposed the Viet Cong, just as I was appalled to see that happen on the other side when so many alleged communists were massacred in Indonesia earlier this year. What, I, what I'm trying to work toward is the principle that we can settle disputes like this by negotiation rather than by military action. Okay. You would be willing, then, to accept Viet Cong control over South Vietnam. I would prefer a coalition government. I don't like totalitarianism. I don't like terrorism. But if the Viet Cong did win a free election in the South, I would say the Vietnamese have the right to decide their own fate. However, even under those conditions, I'm convinced that Vietnam, if left to itself under its own communist control, would not voluntarily ally itself with either the Russian or the Chinese empires. Instead, I think we would see it become a Yugoslavian kind of state, and that would help a great deal toward the neutralization of Southern, Southeast Asia. Despite the escalation, do you feel it may be possible by protesting the war as you have to influence administration policy in the direction of a negotiated settlement? I do. And toward that end, I've been working as co-chairman with Reverend William Sloan, Coffin of Yale, of the National Voters Pledge Campaign. It's an attempt to collect as many thousands of signed pledges as we can from people who will support and vote for candidates in 1966 who are for a settlement of the war that involves American initiatives to encourage negotiations with all the concerned parties, including the Viet Cong. How do you reconcile this kind of political approach with public opinion polls, polls that the president often cites that indicate the large majority of American public 
is in favor of the administration's Vietnam policy. If you really look at those polls and at a growing number of Congress congressional campaigns, I think you will discover that the majority of the American public is actually in a very confused state of mind. On the one hand, they say they support pre present policy and the harder line Johnson has been following. But on the other hand, in recent campaigns in New York and California, among other places, Vietnam was the most important issue and a number of candidates were, ve were vying with one another to show how implacably they opposed the administration's policy. Those are the young whom you are encouraging to engage in this kind of political protest often adopt a non a non exclusionary policy in terms of with whom they'll work with whom they'll work toward these ends. They have openly stated their willingness to collaborate, for instance, with the communists seeking a peaceful solution to the war in Vietnam. You had some bitter experiences with communists in the thirties. How do you feel about this tendency of the new left? Doesn't it leave them prey to manipulation? I'm not sure because I think we're confronted with quite different communists today. I don't know if my communist friends will like me for saying this, but communism, at least the orthodox Russian and the American Communist Party variety, isn't what it used to be. And that heartens me. I think it has evolved. Do you think such activities as stalling cars and spreading garbage on busy thoroughfares, both of which have been done by militant civil rights groups in New York City, help change public attitudes and promote the cause of integration? The sort of thing, by not being directed specifically at those doing the discriminating, can have a harmful effect in terms of reaching and convincing the whole convincing the large numbers of people you want to improve conditions. I am not saying that I'm opposed to all demonstrations. I've taken part in many and have blessed many others. Human nature being what it is, demonstrations have been and will continue to be a necessary part of the struggle for civil rights. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are the possible bad results and psychological effects that disturb you? For one thing, it could lead to more rioting, probably though not inevitably. For another, it could diminish the efforts of many Negroes toward integration in schools and housing. You already hear talk about making Harlem a beautiful black community and about working for beautiful black schools. And you hear of some Negro leaders who say, though I'm not so sure they mean it entirely, but rather are speaking for effect at meetings, that they have abandoned any belief in integration. They say I have no white friends. This is what disturbs me about the possible effects of black power, how far it will go to reject all white Commodorous. Commodorous. Yeah. Anyways. How high would you say the odds are against peace? I don't like to put it in terms of odds. I would say that if I lived on another planet, and if I were a very superior type of being with extraordinary fact facilities for knowing just what's happening on Earth, I would certainly bet that we've come close to extinguishing the human race by war. On the other hand, I wouldn't give too great odds because I would not I would also know that the human race, with all its irrationalities and follies, has always blundered through. Do you think peaceful coexistence with the communist world is a possible? Is possible? Certainly. I've never taken the position that communi communi communism is the same as diabolism or that our main function in foreign policy should be, a, should be to defeat communism. 
I think we can coexist with communist countries, but there are certain features of communism I think we ought to continue to protest and to hope will be ended by evolution. For example, at this late date in Russian communism, the sending of writers to Siberia for four years because they were critical of certain aspects of Russian communist society. I protest this, but that doesn't mean that we have to go to war with them. With the damage already done in our relations relationship with China, what would you do now to rectify it? Well, if I were present, which my fellow citizens have taken the greatest pains to prevent, I would announce my willingness, indeed my anxiousness, to get China into the family of nations. I would propose seating China in the United Nations if she would accept the minimum that the UN Charter requires, and that's a pretty low minimum. I would also make an effort to leave the future fate of Formosa to a plebiscite to be held when peaceful relations were established between Red China and the rest of the community of nations. To what extent do you feel that human life is still short, brutal, and nasty? Well, I don't think it's gotten worse, but certainly, as of right now, two-thirds of the world's population live on the edge of starvation. For them, Hobbes' description still holds true, and even others who are not close to starving still act with brutality. Why? Part of the answer, I expect, is that just as there is a sizable amount of innate irrationality in man, so there is also innate brutality. I'm reminded again of recent events in Indonesia there was no real formal fighting to speak of, but the reaction but the reaction to the attempted communist coup against the government led to the killing of upward of 300,000 alleged communists in cold blood. What kind of humanity is that? How do you get more people involved? Part of the fault lies with many of us who are on fire with an idea, but who need training and self-discipline in communicating that fire to others. Too many radicals are better at communicating among themselves, although they fight awfully hard than they are at communicating with the unconverted. There are people I love and respect who have almost a genius for boring or antagonizing audiences. Also, there must, be, there must be ways to shake up magazines and newspapers and television and radio in the direction of getting people interested in issues unrelated to their own self-interest and in becoming active in solving them. How one does that, I cannot tell you. And once again, I say this is some, something the young must work on. Are there any current functions of the federal government you think could be handled on a state or local level? To give you an intelligent answer, I'd have to spend a lot of time researching. As of the moment, I can't give you any illustrations in view both of my concept of what needs to be done and of the, alter and of the alternatives to having the federal government do it. The federal government simply had to step into the overall problem of education, for example, because of the inequitable distribution of wealth in this country. You can't expect some regions to furnish proper education all on their own. They don't have the resources. Well, what's so monstrous about the doctrine of inherited wealth? Don't people have the right to transfer their gains if they haven't been ill-gotten to their hires? As it is, the taxes now on inherited wealth appear to many to be con confiscatory. Ah, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> appear to many to be Whatever. But what is it? that is passed on nowadays, usually it's shares of stocks and maybe bonds. They represent a continuing 
and indefinite claim on another man's labor. The dead man isn't working any longer. You could say that. Andrew Carnegie, for one example, made possible the expansion of an important industry, steel, and so his gains were not ill-gotten. But since his death, his hires have not participated in the building and expansion of the industry. In terms of Norman Thomas socialism, how, ever, how would you distinguish between socialism and communism, traditional and Chinese oriented? Well, basically in terms of civil liberties, individual rights, democratic so socialists are very much concerned with that. Communists are not. I abominate the whole idea of totalitarianism, the whole idea that it's the business of the state to try to impose standards, even in art. I may be a square myself, but it isn't the business of the state to object to abstract painting or to any other kind of expression, however far out or However far out or unpopular, that's a very dangerous business. Just because you need a strong state to see that the hungry don't stay hungry, that the air isn't terribly polluted. It's all the more important to remember that the state has no business doing the kinds of things the communists have done to their own people and have tried to do to others. What do you still believe capitalism to be immoral? Why do you still believe capitalism to be immoral? Our society prospers on a basis that hasn't too much to do with real equality or, in, or justice. We can simply produce so much that we're able to keep the mouth of protest fairly silent with bread and considerable portions of cake. Capitalism also makes it possible for people to yield so easily to the temptation of going after personal gain, regardless of the consequences. For instance, it wasn't any essential viciousness in the drug industry that led to the kind of conditions that the late Senator Koffever exposed. High administration prices and insufficient controls on the efficacy and potential danger of new drugs. Rather, it was that exuberant excessive emphasis on profits that is epidemic that is 